So I've got three lectures this week um, on this topic, uh, context, motivation, and mood. And I want to start by introducing uh, the topic, uh, and then we'll move on to uh, in the second lecture, which is the second video, uh, talk a little bit about motivation and mood, and then I'll talk about a phenomenon known as ego depletion. Now, all of these things go together, so I want to introduce it with, uh, uh, with an example. Uh, so suppose you are driving uh, to uh, campus, or you're driving home, or you're driving anywhere, uh, and this is the kind of situation you're faced with. Now, one of the upsides about uh, taking uh, courses at home, of course, is you don't have to drive very much. I have to say, um, as long since I've been working from home and doing most of this work from home, uh, although it gets a little lonely sometimes, it gets a little tiring sometimes, I really don't miss driving to Western. Uh, it's not a long drive for me, but it gets, it gets kind of tiring after a while. But anyway, back to the example. Uh, you've probably all experienced this uh, if you're a driver, right? Uh, so you're driving behind a lot of cars, the road is very icy, uh, and it's pretty stressful. So put yourself in this situation. You've got to you know, pay attention to uh, people very close to you, in front of you, and behind you. Uh, you've got to pay attention to uh, when somebody stops. Uh, it can be really stressful, and it can be mentally exhausting. Now, suppose the very next thing you do uh, when you arrive at your workplace, which is what I would do, uh, is that I have to be a professor, right? So this isn't me, obviously. Uh, this is uh, just a random image that I pulled up on Google uh, Image Search, as I often do. Uh, and it turns out if you type in professor uh, on Google Image Search, you almost always get a picture of a late 50s, uh, middle-aged uh, white man in front of a chalkboard. Uh, that just seems to be what Google thinks a professor is. So what do you think is going to happen? Uh, well, this has happened to me. Lots of times I've had to drive uh, to campus, and it's been a stressful, uh, mentally exhausting drive, and I don't feel like it's my best lecture. Uh, I feel as if uh, the context or the situation of being in a stressful drive has made me mentally exhausted uh, and a little bit tired. And so my thinking ability or my ability to be a good professor uh, can be impaired. Let's look at another example. Uh, suppose this is the next, suppose you're in this situation. You're driving somewhere and you've got kids fighting uh, behind you. Now, again, these are not my kids. This is just a random picture I pulled up on Google Image Search. I typed in uh, kids fighting in the back seat. Uh, and you can see this is probably something that if you have siblings, uh, you probably remember this kind of thing. Clearly, the young boy in the middle there uh, is enjoying the fact that he's antagonizing his sister uh, and she's upset about something. Now, if you're the driver, if you're the parent, uh, this can be very stressful because you've got a lot of activity behind you uh, and you're trying to pay attention uh, to where you're going. You've got to pay attention to driving and you've got this uh, noise and activity behind you. One of the things that you end up doing, uh, and if you've ever been in this situ situation, you probably recognize it, is you have to work really hard mentally to ignore something. In other words, you have to engage in a behavior known as cognitive control. Uh, you're trying to in inhibit uh, paying attention to something behind you. Uh, now, of course, if the next thing you need to do uh, is something like this, let's say doing science, uh, some kind of uh, mentally taxing activity or something that requires a lot of concentration, one possibility, uh, and as we'll discuss in the third lecture on ego depletion, one possibility is that your ability to concentrate is going to be slightly affected because you had to use a lot of your mental resources uh, in order to ignore or inhibit paying attention to the fighting behind you. Uh, it kind of ta saps your resources a little bit so that when you have to then engage in some sort of detail-oriented uh, or uh, cognitively demanding subsequent task, your performance decreases. Uh, so that's going to be kind of the topic of this week. Uh, and what I want to do is frame it within the context of the dual process account that we talked about uh, back early on in this course. So if you remember the dual process account, this is where we talk about two systems, right? A fast system and a slower system. System one is the fast intuitive associative system. It's thought to be parallel and automatic. And system two is this slower verbal reason-based system. It's thought to be serial and deliberate. And it can often override system one 
Uh, but system one, remember, provides the often provides the output or the behavior more quickly, uh, and so you have to work to override it. Now this is kind of a short, uh, simplistic description of the two systems. Let's look at a slightly uh, more involved description. Uh, so in this longer, uh, more involved description of the two systems, uh, we've got the type 1 system and the type 2 system. On the left uh, are behaviors, defining features and correlates, uh, and ways to describe this intuitive type 1 process. Uh, the defining feature, uh, or what would be considered the most one of the most important features of system one thinking is that it doesn't require working memory. Uh, so you don't have to have working memory resources available. Uh, many of these behaviors happen without your thinking about it. So remember what we talked about a few weeks ago. Uh, so remember some of the components of working memory. Uh, it's also an autonomous system. So it works on its own. Uh, you don't have to de devote uh, resources to it. Uh, you don't have to try to think things through. Uh, often, the output of, be of type 1 thinking uh, happens automatically. Uh, so these typical correlates, as you can see, uh, it's fast, it's high capacity, it operates in parallel, it's non-conscious. These are all things that are correlated with this idea of a system or a type of thinking that does not require working memory. Uh, it's uh, biased responses, so these are things like the heuristics that we talked about. It's based on your memory. Uh, it's contextualized, meaning that many of these things are uh, uh, primed by a particular context, location, or situation. Uh, it's associative and automatic, uh, and it's based on your experience. Another way of thinking about it, and this is sort of this evolutionary uh, way of thinking about it is listed at the very bottom here. So system one, which we can also call the old mind, uh, evolved early. So it uses uh, parts of the brain uh, which were known to evolve earlier uh, in the course of mammalian uh, cortex uh, evolution. So other non-human primates, non-human animals uh, have these systems as well. Uh, so a lot of what we're doing is similar to animal cognition, associative learning. Uh, basic emotions and implicit knowledge. So all of this fast, uh, autonomous parallel processing is consistent with type 1 thinking. Type 2 thinking, on the other hand, is reflective. Uh, it requires working memory. So you have to be able to consider uh, the outputs of the system uh, within a working memory uh, framework. Uh, it requires some mental simulation and some cognitive decoupling. It's slower. It's got limited capacity. It's serial, meaning you can think of one thing and then think of the next thing. Uh, it's conscious. Uh, so when you're thinking about uh, solving a problem or making a decision, these are things that are active uh, in your conscious process. Um, it also requires some degree of cognitive control. So it takes up resources, and it requires your ability to control it. So this doesn't always give you the fast answer. It doesn't always give you the answer that is uh, correspondent with a heuristic or a bias. So it may require some additional thinking or logic. Or, if we want to think about it in the context of uh, evolutionary psychology, it's a later evolved system. Uh, researchers would describe it as being distinctly human. Uh, now, there are some components to this which might be present in non-human primates. Certainly, non-human primates can, be, uh, can learn uh, to use language-like behavior. So that component seems to be there. Uh, other animals can engage in uh, tasks that seem like they are able to inhibit responses. But the entire package of System 2, or Type 2 thinking, seems to be human. Uh, and it involves explicit knowledge and fairly complex emotions. So this is not one theory. Uh, this is a set of theories. Uh, but it's a, it's a good conceptual framework to think about some of the things we're going to talk about, particularly in this unit. Uh, okay, so when we talk about uh, the effects of context, or the effects of motivation, or the effects of mood and ego depletion and cognitive resources, we're often talking about the balance of type 1 and type 2 thinking. Uh, so outputs of system 1 
uh, or those that are going to be uh, available more quickly. Outputs of System 2 might require some time, but they also require effort. So that's what I want to talk about in the very next uh, series of slides. I want to talk about uh, a type of task that can measure and understand the amount of uh, effortful control that individuals can place into the kinds of uh, behaviors uh, that they're able to do. So let's look at this example and uh, then discuss the example. So the example that I'm referring to is a series of studies that were carried out um, in the early 1970s originally uh, by a psychologist named Walter Mischel. Uh, and we sort of colloquially call these marshmallow tests. And you've probably heard of this before. You've almost certainly heard of it. Uh, and it's this idea that there's a one way to measure uh, self-control and inhibitory control and a delay of gratification, which is a series of behaviors that requires self-control, uh, is to present people, in this case children, uh, with some kind of desirable reward. It, in one experiment, in a lot of experiments, it's often a, something good to eat, like a marshmallow. Uh, straightforward, simple, uh, something that they might like to eat, uh, and then you tell them uh, to wait. Uh, so they see the marshmallow, and you tell them, wait a little bit. Uh, if you can wait, you can have two marshmallows. Uh, and so the idea is, how long can they wait without eating the one marshmallow so that they could get two marshmallows? That's the example that's in the video. So. Um, I had posted a link uh, to the OWL site uh, with a link to a YouTube video uh, that starts, uh, and it's the one that's shown here on this slide. If you haven't watched it already, please go watch it now before you continue on with the lecture. Uh, so you can pause the lecture here, uh, open up another browser tab, and watch this video. Uh, and a couple of things I want you to look out for. And if you did see it, uh, maybe go back and watch it again. And a few of the things I want you to look for uh, first of all, you'll notice that some of the younger kids are the ones who have the most difficulty. So there seems to be a developmental trajectory. Some of the older kids are able to wait. Some of the younger kids are not. Uh, a second thing I want you to notice uh, is that many of the kids do things to try to distract themselves. Sometimes they squirm a lot. Uh, sometimes they fidget. They tap things. So they engage in a lot of distracting behaviors, things to keep their mind off of the temptation in order to help them wait a little bit longer. We'll come back to that idea later when we talk about the original study. Uh, so if you haven't watched it yet, why don't you pause this video. Uh, if you have watched it, you can go watch it again. Uh, if you just watched it recently, then just keep on with this video because I want to talk about the experiment uh, a little bit. But watching the video really helps because uh, it sort of gives you a, um, a really good example about what this looks like. So this is one of the original studies, uh, and it's closely associated with Walter Mischel. Uh, and Walter Mischel uh, was at Stanford University uh, and kind of came up with this paradigm uh, and designed it as a way to test attentional mechanisms and delay of gratification. So I'm going to talk about several of these studies. Uh, and in most cases, they had a, uh, a setup that was similar to what you saw in the video. Uh, so uh, they had a case where children were presented with something desirable, uh, and they wanted to see how long they could wait. Uh, they measured how long they could wait. They could uh, either wait for a certain amount of time. Uh, they could call the researcher or the experimenter back in to get the reward. Uh, and they also looked at different ways, uh, different kinds of distractions, whether or not they could uh, give them, uh, give the subjects uh, different kinds of uh, things to think about or different ways to construe the task that would make it easier for them to delay their gratification. Uh, so let's look at some of these uh, different uh, conditions. So here's what they told their subject. So this is very similar to what you probably saw, uh, to what we saw in the video. Uh, so for subjects assigned to three delay of gratification conditions, uh, and this was groups one, two, and three, and we'll see later uh, where those fall out, uh, the experimenter next removed the cake tin from behind the barrier and placed it on the table in front of them, giving them these instructions. Let's see what's under here. I bet it's a surprise. Oh boy, look at that, a marshmallow and a pretzel. So there's two choices here. Uh, which would you like to eat? You can eat either the marshmallow or the pretzel. At this point, the child chose uh, which one they wanted to eat. Uh, so that way, you know, if you're one of those kids that doesn't like marshmallows and you like pretzels more, uh, you at least get to choose the one that you want. And so this would be something you really like. 
um, oh, you know what? I have to go out of the room now. And if you can wait until I come back by myself, then you can eat this one, pointing to the chosen object, right up. But, you know, if you don't want to wait, you can ring the bell and bring me back anytime you want. But if you ring the bell, you can't have this one. You have to have the unchosen one. So ring the bell and bring me back. You can't have the blank, but you can have the blank. In other words, if you want the marshmallow, but you can't wait, you bring them back and you can have the pretzel instead. So if you're a marshmallow lover and you can't wait, you can only uh, get a pretzel. They gave some uh, conditions uh, that would uh, allow the child to distract themselves. So they called these overt distraction conditions. A uh, child was left alone in the room with a potentially distracting activity that involved playing with a toy. So uh, just like we saw in the video where the kids were kind of squirming around or tapping things, uh, some of these kids were given something to do so that they wouldn't have to think about the marshmallow. Uh, they could just think about um, playing with the toy. Uh, in group one, each subject was also given a delay of gratification contingency instruction and thus was waiting for the possibility of getting the preferred food object if he waited long enough and the less preferred object if he did not delay long enough. In group four, the child was left alone merely to play as long as they wished. In both of these groups, prior to leaving the room, the experimenter placed the slinky on the floor and informed the child that he could play with the slinky on the floor for as long as he wanted, and he could ring the bell whatever he wanted to bring back the experimenter, regardless of whether the child rang the bell or waited. He could play with the toys until the experimenter came back. So in other words, in both of these groups, you get something fun to do. Um, they also had uh, conditions where you could explain uh, a way to think that would make it easier to delay. So this is called the distraction through condition, cognition-inducing instructions. Group two and five, before leaving the room, the experimenter gave the subject instructions designed to encourage the child to generate his own thoughts. Um, I think these were uh, boys and girls, uh, not just boys, but they, in those days, sometimes just used he uh, to refer uh, to both. But uh, you can assume this applies, in, we would write they uh, nowadays, or he and she. Um, so they said, oh, while I'm gone, you can think of anything that's fun to think of for as long as you want to. Uh, and if you want, can you tell me something to think about? So they asked the, the child, you know, what would you like to think about that's fun? And the child's example said, yeah, no matter what. Then the experiment added other examples. You can also think about singing songs or playing with toys or anything that's fun. Uh, and then they get the same instructions. You can bring me back and have the pretzel, but if you can wait, you can have the marshmallow. So let's look at what some of the data uh, uh, looked like. So here is a, um, this shows you all three experiments that they ran in this one particular paper. Uh, and it shows the mean waiting time. So the higher that bar, or the longer that number, uh, so the higher that number, that's the longer they could wait. And on the far left, you see a, in experiment one, the no ideation uh, group. Uh, the no ideation group uh, is a group that was asked to look at the rewards. In other words, this was very close to the what we saw in the video. Marshmallow was right in front of them. They weren't given anything to think about, and you can see they didn't wait very long. Uh, in subsequent experiments, when the rewards were available for them to look at, uh, and they were asked to think about something fun to do, um, they could wait longer. Uh, so they had they were asked to think about something, and they had something fun to do. Uh, when they were asked to think just about the reward itself, in other words, they were given instructions to think about how they could last, if they could just wait longer, uh, they would be given, uh, they would have the opportunity uh, to, um, they, they would be able to wait a little bit longer, they would be able to have that uh, the reward that they wanted. Uh, they could wait a little bit longer, but not as long as the group that got something fun to do. Um, as you can see in the right-hand side, rewards not available for attention. In this case, the rewards uh, were not, they, they couldn't see what the rewards were. Uh, so they were taken away from view and they were given something else to do. And in that case, they didn't see as much of a difference between the no ideation group and the think fun group. They were both able to wait. Uh, when they were then asked to think about the reward in that experiment, uh, their waiting time decreased because they were, although the reward wasn't in front of them, they were asked to think about it. Now, this is only one series of experiments, but Michelle did a lot of research on this paradigm, and it holds up pretty well. Uh, when kids are given uh, rewards uh, and asked to delay gratification, uh, they don't 
usually wait too long if they don't have anything else to think about. But when they're given other kinds of conditions that make it easier to wait, uh, to distract themselves or to think about something else or an instruction uh, to think about how good the reward will be if they can just wait, uh, they're able to wait a little bit longer. In other words, the delay of gratification is possible for these kids. It's just not something that comes naturally uh, to all of them. So that's the what I want to talk about for the next few slides. I want to talk about the individual differences, and then that'll be the last topic that I cover uh, in this video. So additional research looked at uh, whether or not you could predict later performance, so adolescent uh, cognitive uh, strategies, from what happened when you were in preschool. In other words, they studied a bunch of kids in preschool and measured their ability to delay gratification, and then they followed them up uh, in high school and looked to see how they were doing on standardized tests and looked to see what their parents said about their ability to delay gratification. They found what you would expect. In other words, they found that kids who had difficulty delaying gratification in preschool were often rated by their parents as having trouble delaying gratification, and they performed slightly worse on some standardized tests. But uh, that difference didn't always appear when they were asked, uh, when they were put in some of the other conditions that gave them something to think about. In other words, if they had a strategy, if they did well with a, with a thinking strategy or a diversion strategy, then those correlations seem to disappear. Let's look at what that data looks like. But I think you get the idea. We're taking the same children that we track in preschool, and then we're looking at them again in adolescence. And this shows, uh, so I'm going to show two different slides. The first slide is going to show uh, correlations between preschool delay time and adolescent coping questionnaire that their parents filled out. And then the next slide on the, that you can't see here, but on the next slide you'll see uh, correlations between uh, the delay time and a standardized test of scholastic aptitude. Uh, so here are some questionnaire items, and these are items that parents would answer. How likely is your child to be sidetracked by minor setbacks? And what you see is the significant correlations marked with asterisks uh, for four different conditions. The conditions with spontaneous ideation, in other words, kids uh, would be able to distract themselves spontaneously, uh, or uh, kids were able to we're given some suggestions for things to think about. And then within that, you're given the conditions where the rewards are exposed. In other words, the children can have to look at the marshmallow the whole time, uh, or the rewards are obscured. They're shown what they can get, and then it's taken out of view. And what you see there is a strong negative correlation between the amount of time that they can wait uh, and how they're rated on that coping item. So that means that if you couldn't wait a long time, you were rated more highly on how likely is your child to be sidetracked by minor setbacks? That negative 0 0.30 correlation means that the longer you could wait, uh, the less likely you were to be sidetracked. So if that makes sense, whenever there's that negative correlation, uh, that's what that means. You see the next item, how likely is your child to exhibit self-control in frustrating situations? You see the positive correlation, 0.58. In other words, the longer you could wait as a preschooler, the more likely your parents think that you can, you can inhibit, so exhibit self-control. So there seems to be something there. Um, what you'll notice is that most of these correlations disappear uh, when uh, some of these other conditions are introduced. In other words, as long as the children had either the rewards obscured or some kind of suggestion for a coping strategy, uh, they didn't show these strong correlations. Not always, they didn't all disappear, but most of them disappeared. So that suggests that it's only in this uh, rewards exposed spontaneous ideation condition that the strong correlations uh, seem to come out. We're gonna see the same pattern with, uh, with academic performance. So in the United States, if any of you uh, are familiar with uh, the U.S. education system, um, in, in order to get into university or college uh, or a second uh, post-secondary education, you usually have to take a standardized test. Uh, this is similar to the GRE test or the MCAT test. It's called the SAT, the Scholastic Aptitude Test. So it's a standardized test that's used by a lot of universities and colleges for admission. So it's a pretty good test of uh, basic academic achievement. 
um, that standardizes performance regardless of what school or background or anything like that. There's, you know, the, there's lots of debate and concerns about whether or not these are good for college admissions, but they're pretty good for what uh, we want to use here, uh, and that is uh, to determine whether or not things that these participants did as children correlate with their performance as adolescents. And you can see that their verbal performance, in other words, this is uh, sort of vocabulary and knowledge uh, about uh, verbal uh, reasoning, uh, and quantitative or math ability seems to be correlated with that spontaneous ideation rewards exposed condition, which was very similar to what we saw in the video. In other words, the longer you could wait, the higher your performance seemed to be on those. Uh, and this is a really core finding in this literature. There seems to be something about this tendency which emerges early on for a lot of these kids that they can just wait a little bit longer. That seems to be able to uh, correlate with later observations of their self-control. It seems to correlate with academic achievement as well. Uh, and one possibility is that these children, whether it's by virtue of expanded working memory capacity, uh, or expanded executive control are better able to employ inhibitory processes so that they can wait just a little bit longer. And that same tendency to inhibit uh, wanting to have the marshmallow also allows you to inhibit maybe uh, quitting studying a little bit earlier, or it allows you to stick with a task just a little bit longer or study just a little bit longer. I don't know if that's the case, but that's one of the suggestions that's being made. So the answer, you know, the, the full understanding of this result uh, is still being debated, but that's the general consensus, is that there's something that uh, co-occurs with the tendency to delay gratification early on that correlates with the tendency to maybe study just a little bit longer, practice just a little bit longer, or persevere just a little bit longer. So I want to finish up by asking you to think about this within the context of the multiple systems approach. Uh, and to think about this as uh, one strategy that you can use uh, when you are trying to make decisions or solve problems yourself uh, is to adopt what's known as a default interventionist approach. The default interventionist approach assumes that we're always thinking according to system one and system two. So we're always doing fast things and we occasionally need to do slow things. To learn default interventionism, uh, is to learn ways in which you can occasionally check the output of System 1 with System 2. In other words, you occasionally have to override System 1's response with a System 2 response. And that means being aware, and that requires a little bit more working memory capacity. That requires some inhibitory control. It requires the ability to not always uh, respond to the system one output and to occasionally check whether or not that's the right answer. So that's the end of this lecture, but I want to keep want you to keep this in mind uh, when we talk about the next uh, two topics. So the next lecture is going to be about uh, motivation and mood, and then I'll have a final lecture on cognitive resources. But I also want you to keep this uh, default interventionist approach uh, in mind when I talk about uh, problem-solving, decision-making, and expertise uh, in subsequent weeks.